everyone and welcome back to my channel. So today's going to be a little bit different. Normally I do pretty large, you know, incredibly detailed missing persons cases, long stories, crazy stories, and it's always bothered me that it's difficult to make videos on the smaller cases that you guys send me. You know, I get tagged a lot on Twitter, on Facebook about all these small cases. Usually they're very current ones and I never know what to do because I can't really create a video that you guys would sit down and watch on these very small cases because the video will be like three minutes long. I feel like that's not going to grab anyone's attention. So I'm going to start making videos that are going to be about two or three very small cases combined. I just was feeling incredibly guilty and upset every time I would be tagged in a missing persons case where the only information was a picture, their stats, and where they went missing. And I always felt so bad that I couldn't really make a whole video on it, so this is my way of trying to get around it. So in this particular video, I'll be talking about the disappearance of Nadia Atwi and Jerome Azell. So we'll first start off with Nadia Atwi. Nadia was 32 years old when she went missing from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada on December 8th, 2017. So this case is incredibly fresh. She was a wife and a mother to a beautiful two-year-old little boy and she was also a loved kindergarten teacher at a private Arabic school in Edmonton. She was last seen in the area of 48th Street and 146th Avenue at 6.30 a.m. by her husband. Nadia's mother Salwa showed up to their house that morning. She was planning on picking up Nadia to do, I guess, carpooling to work. But when she arrived, Nadia's husband opened the door and was surprised to see her because earlier that morning, Nadia had told her husband that she was the one going to pick her mother up and not the other way around. So they assumed it was just a mix up. She would eventually make it into work. They would laugh about it, but she never ever made it to work. At 12.30 p.m., police ended up finding Nadia's car in a ditch near Rundle Park. Her phone was in the car, her wallet was in the car, and they found a shoe nearby the car. Now, I don't know if it's confirmed that the shoe was, in fact, one that Nadia was wearing that day, but they felt it was important enough to mention it, so I'm guessing it probably was. Obviously, her car showing up in a ditch and no one being able to contact her and her leaving early in the morning, getting things mixed up, was very, very alarming for a lot of people, so they immediately sent off search teams. They brought in dogs, they brought in everything they could to the Rundle Park area. They searched the entire city, they searched homeless shelters, but they didn't really find anything of importance and they didn't find Nadia. They went through her phones and her emails next to see if maybe there was a reason she was running away, if she had mentioned it to someone, if she was calling people before she disappeared, but that gave them absolutely no answers as to why she ran off and disappeared in the way that she did. Nadia's husband then came forward and revealed that Nadia had been suffering from bipolar disorder for years years and she was actually going through an episode at the time of her disappearance. She had apparently left her home before but she always returned within 24 hours and the entire time she was gone she stayed in touch with her family. But this time was different because she didn't ever end up coming home and she completely lost touch with everyone and as I said before her cell phone was left behind in the car. According to her husband she might be incredibly confused if she's approached by someone, she probably won't want to speak to anybody, she will withdraw herself from crowds if she is out there somewhere, and she is in desperate need of medication. Since her disappearance, there have been no significant leads whatsoever. As I said, all of her information was checked, phone, emails, everything, and there was not a single hint as to where she might have gone. No one understands why she would have gone to Rundle Park in specific. No one understands why she would have ended up in a ditch. Nothing makes sense. And when it comes to the car, there were no signs of foul play. One of the search teams did, however, find some item of importance that they won't disclose. I'm not exactly sure why. Usually they don't disclose information if foul play is involved. If it's just a missing person, they will. So I find that uh, a little bit interesting, but they found this beside one of the bridges in Rundle Park that runs over the Saskatchewan River. So that immediately pointed me alongside her bipolar disorder and her very bizarre way of leaving her car to not the best 
theories. I'm not exactly sure what type of bipolar disorder she has. There are a few different types. I don't know exactly what episode she was having. I'm not sure if it was manic, if it was depressive, if it was a mixture of both. But clearly to leave your car in that sort of a state and since there were no signs of foul play around the car, she must have been very upset and very panicked, possibly overwhelmed. Um, with manic episodes, usually you can become overwhelmed incredibly easily. If you have a bad manic episode, you usually have to be put into the hospital because of how overwhelmed and anxious and you know irritable and terrible it makes you feel. If she was in a depressive episode, she could have been suicidal, um, and that's where I'm concerned about the item being found near the bridge. I'm incredibly worried that she might have jumped off of one of the bridges trying to commit suicide. The Saskatchewan River is absolutely massive. I'm curious to know if they have done any sort of searches with helicopter or maybe drones. I think that could be very beneficial when it comes to searching the river itself. If she had walked down to the river though for any reason, I feel like the dogs would have picked that up. So I'm not understanding how how you know her car was there and a shoe was found but then they didn't seem to catch a trail of her anywhere I'm hoping that the theory of suicide ends up being proven wrong it is equally as likely that she was just overwhelmed and upset and ran away and at this point you know usually episodes last about two weeks but as I said usually sometimes they can last a year on. But at this point, there's a huge chance that she is no longer in an episode, but she's just so embarrassed and possibly ashamed that she doesn't want to come forward, she doesn't want to come home at this point, which means she could be just wandering around out there somewhere, part of the homeless population. If you can, please, please get her picture out, especially if you are in Canada and in the specific area. Exposure is absolutely everything, and I know that her family is trying incredibly hard, but they are experiencing their own issues. There was a vigil where her husband was attacked by people. There are a lot of accusations going around and you know tensions obviously high at this point. So whatever we can do to possibly help this family, help reach out to her, bring her home would be absolutely amazing. Nadia is five foot eight, weighs between 170 and 180 pounds. She was last seen wearing dark clothing and she could possibly be wearing a hijab. It's also possible that she's only wearing one shoe or wearing no shoes. If you saw a woman running around in distress that day in the area with only one shoe, please call any tips in you possibly can. So now we are going to get into the disappearance of Jerome Azell and this disappearance, I have no clue why it isn't bigger than it is because I'm infuriated with how it's been treated so far. Um, personally, I think this screams foul play. This screams that something huge is wrong and that's kind of just being ignored by the police department. Jerome was 27 years old when he went missing on November 7th, 2017 from Lansing, Michigan. He is the father of one little boy with another baby on the way and the boyfriend to Jasmine Hill. He was last seen wearing Timberland boots, black jeans, and a red shirt with a black leather jacket on top. And he lived on the west side of Lansing, Michigan. Jerome and Jasmine share a car, and early that morning he drove Jasmine to work. He dropped her off at around 9.30 and said that in about an hour he was going to be dropping their son Gianni off at the babysitter's house. Now, from what I've seen, I'm pretty sure the babysitter was someone babysitting out of their home, and I'm also pretty positive positive that this babysitter's house was in the exact same neighborhood that Jerome and Jasmine lived in. So it was essentially right down the street. But 10.20 a.m., about 10 minutes before he was technically supposed to drop his son off at daycare, he texted the daycare provider and told them that he was in the car and on the way. But he never actually showed up. So at 4.30, Jasmine was trying to text him. She got no response. I guess that wasn't too out of character at first. Two and a half hours later, when he still hadn't responded to any text messages or calls, she became a little nervous. So I'm guessing she tried to track their car to figure out where he was and realized that the OnStar navigation system had been turned off. So she quickly turned it back on and was able to locate their car. But the area it was in was not a place that Jerome would have been. At 7.20 p.m. that night, police found his car in the Grosbeck neighborhood by Fairview Park. 
and their little boy was in the back seat still. The keys were on the passenger seat, but Jerome was gone. The child was immediately taken to the hospital. He's in complete good health, they said, other than a diaper change that was much needed. The little boy was completely fine, but he'd been sitting there for hours. This made no sense to anyone because Jerome had previous children from other relationships. He was a great father. He loved this little boy like no other. He was born two months early on Mother's Day. They spent a whole month in the NICU. There was a huge, huge bond there and this baby boy was only five months old. So Jerome would never have left this little boy in the car and just walked off. It made absolutely no sense. Despite this, police refused to label it as foul play and only a missing person because according to them there was no signs of foul play with the vehicle again no one broke into the car there was no damage the doors were unlocked and the keys were in the passenger seat police and the fire department came quickly to the area to try to search the woods for him they had night vision cameras they brought everything they possibly could and they searched the wooded area in Grosbeck now the Grosbeck neighborhood is a country club neighborhood so the area he was essentially parked in was part of a golf course so it's mainly golf course with some trees around it and it's surrounded by neighborhoods so it wasn't like it was a huge area of just wooded nothingness to search he couldn't have gotten lost in these woods it was you kind of walk through for five minutes and then you're on the other side but despite all of their search efforts they couldn't find Jerome anywhere they took fingerprints of the entire car but nothing came back with those they also checked his phone records and nothing was found with that either so there was nothing at all pointing to why he would have just ran off on his own he made no indication of that to his girlfriend, hadn't mentioned it to anyone he knew, there were no records of strange conversations through phone or emails or anything like that, so again, it made absolutely no sense. Jerome's girlfriend ended up hiring a private investigator after having many, many raffles to raise money, and she also put up a $10,000 reward in hopes of getting someone to come forward and say something. With Christmas drawing closer, Jasmine Hill is doing whatever it takes to bring her missing boyfriend, Jerome Ezell, home. It's been more than a month since he vanished, and the family has yet to find any leads on where he could be. I've been hosting search parties. We've checked everywhere in the area, 150 mile radius of where the car was found. Although she was relieved to find their son, she's afraid something terrible may have happened to Jerome. Police found no evidence of foul play, but the family suspects something more, which is why they started a GoFundMe account to hire a private investigator. Since hiring the private investigator, over 50 people have been interviewed, mainly Jerome's friends and family. Background checks have been made, gone over every bit of evidence that he possibly can, and I'm not sure if he's gotten anywhere in the case so far, but I'm hoping he's finding at least something out, because to me, this 100% involves foul play. Now, I don't necessarily want to get full blown into theories with this case because there really isn't a lot of information but this is just one of those things where when you start researching it you can just tell that things are very very off so the area he went missing in like I said is incredibly bizarre and he told the daycare provider at 10 20 that he was in his car on the way now like i said i'm pretty sure the daycare provider was in the neighborhood they lived in so it probably would have taken like five maybe ten minutes pushing it tops for him to have arrived there especially if he was supposed to drop the little boy off at 10 30 and he texted at 10 20 but the grosbeck neighborhood is about 15 plus minutes away from where he lives so why would he say he was in the car on the way there just to drive 15 minutes to the grosbeck neighborhood and then drive 15 minutes back. That makes absolutely no sense. I've seen a few things online where people suggest he might have been going to do some sort of drug deal or going to meet someone in the park to talk to them. But first of all, why bring your five month old son to any of that? As I said, his car was parked in a country club neighborhood. If police think he really did just drive his car there, park, and then run away, why would he choose a place that was you know, probably covered top to bottom in security cameras. And I know a lot of people's arguments will be, oh, well, he wanted the kid to be found. You know, he wanted to run away, but he wanted to make sure the kid was in an area where, you know, he would be located and safely taken back to his mother. But if that was the case, why wouldn't he have just dropped Gianni off at the daycare provider's house? If his plan the entire time was to run away, 
why would he have texted the daycare provider saying he was on his way to drop Gianni off and then just not do it? Why wouldn't he put his child into safe hands first like he planned on doing, like he told his girlfriend and the provider that he was going to do? Why would he take the child with him and then leave him in a car and run off? That makes zero sense. And the fact that police think that's what happened is absolutely insane to me. If you look at this area where his car was found, it is surrounded by neighborhoods. In a country club area, I am sure that a lot of those houses have surveillance and I hope everyone in that area has checked their surveillance to see if they see the car coming in or out or maybe if they see him walking away from it. Keep in mind, if he dropped the car off there and just walked off, he would have had to walk through all these neighborhoods. According to a witness, his car was there at 1150, so a little over an hour after he left to take Gianni to daycare. To the west of where he went missing, there are houses, a whole entire neighborhood, and a shopping center, and a community college. All those places probably have security cameras. To the south is a school, a hospital, and then a major road where there are shopping centers at every single intersection. To the east is a highway, which would have been difficult for him to cross over, but if he did, guess what's waiting on the other side? more shopping centers. And to the north, it's basically one road out of the area that leads straight to a Walmart, which again, security cameras. So I don't think he could have just dropped the car off here and not be seen by security cameras or anyone walking away. Since that's the case, and since I strongly believe foul play is involved, and I do not think he was the one driving his car, whoever dropped the car off there is probably on camera somewhere. Considering the fact that there didn't appear to be a struggle, my personal belief is that he was at home or he was somewhere with Gianni in the car and he was approached by someone that he knew or, you know, someone that he easily would have trusted. Someone approached him in maybe a friendly manner, maybe asked for something, asked for help, which would have, you know, persuaded him to get out of the vehicle for a minute. And I think this person did something to him. Maybe he went over to a friend's house really quickly and just ran inside the house to get something real fast and something happened to him. If it was someone who didn't know him, maybe they realized there was a baby in the back seat and so they took it to a place like a country club where people would be going in and out all day long. You know, it's just crazy to me because it's so obvious that he didn't just run off. That would make absolutely no sense, but that's how it's being treated, is that he just ran away. His girlfriend and all of his friends and family are not accepting that he just ran away, and they're not just sitting there helping the police do something about it because they obviously aren't going to. They've said on the Facebook page multiple times that Lansing is a place where everyone knows everything. They said a cop car could drive by and, you know, someone random on the street within two seconds would know exactly where it was going and why it was going there. They find it interesting that all of a sudden no one in Lansing Lansing knows anything. Jerome met with foul play that day. I can almost assure you that's what's going to come of this case. They have done searches, they have done everything, the way his car was found, the fact that he didn't drop his son off before deciding to run away. It's possible that he met someone at the country club and maybe got out real quick to jump in their car, but having a baby in the car, I'm sure he probably had the heat on. Why would he have taken the keys out and put them on the passenger seat? You know, I have absolutely no idea, but it's just freaking crazy to me. But those are my two small cases. I know it's not a crazy full-on missing persons video, but these people deserve attention just as much as everyone else that I cover, and I couldn't just sit back and not do anything anymore. It was driving me absolutely crazy. So let me know what you guys think this little series on my channel should be called. I want something to differentiate it from the other cases that I do. If you have any ideas, please leave them down below. Please share this information with anyone and everyone, especially if you were in the area, go follow their Facebook pages, see if you can help out in any way, shape, or form. I know that the families here would appreciate it absolutely more than anything. But I'm gonna go ahead and go, guys. Don't forget to hit that thumbs up button, hit the subscribe button to become a part of the Howland fam, and I'll see you in my next video. Bye.